This is episode 16 of Survival Medicine, Combat Casualty Care and Civilian Applications. At the end of September and the 1st of October, I went to the Scientific Assembly of the American College of Emergency Physicians in uh, Las Vegas and got to go to several courses. And this one I thought was particularly interesting and may have some uh, application uh, for this audience. Uh, this was given by a colonel in the Special Operations Forces, and it's what some of the things that they've learned in combat that may apply over to uh, civilian care. Now, I need to apologize. This is going to be a little bit more technical than uh, what I normally strive for, but there's quite a few EMTs, paramedics, and combat medics uh, that are subscribers. So this will be a little bit geared towards them, but I'll try and keep it uh, still practical on an everyday basis. Now, one of the old ways of looking at trauma care is the ABCDE. That stands for Airway, Breathing, Circulation, Disability, and Exposure. Airway means, uh, is there anything blocking the air coming you know, from the atmosphere into the lungs? Breathing is, is your body actually trying to breathe? Cardiovascular, meaning uh, controlling hemorrhage, uh, supporting blood pressure. Disability uh, refers to, uh, are there any neurologic injuries uh, that we need to find? An E for exposure, meaning cut all the clothes off, look at all the body, make sure you, you identify all injuries. So that's kind of the old way of looking at it. The new is March. Uh, M is now for, stands for massive hemorrhage. That has been pushed from the cardiovascular area up to the top uh, because a lot of the preventable deaths that they think they could have made a difference on were hemorrhage control. Uh, and then it kind of fits back into our normal pathway from the previous slide, airway, meaning do you put a nasopharyngeal airway or oropharyngeal airway? Do you need to intubate them? Do you need to do a surgical airway? Respiratory uh, focuses on pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung uh, that works as like a one-way valve. So every time you breathe, there, more air escapes in between the lung and the chest cavity, increases pressure. And if the pressure gets so much, it can actually push the heart and vessels over enough that it decreases blood supply and decreases blood return to the heart. And you can imagine that usually doesn't go over very well. Cardiac is uh, establishing IV access and giving volume support. And H, which is very important, is hypothermia prevention because anytime blood, uh, I'm sorry, anytime temperature drops below about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the mortality of a trauma patient skyrockets. Now here's one slide real quick kind of that shows um, Exsanguination from extremity wounds is about 9% of preventable deaths. Uh, airway obstruction, 1%. And pneumothorax, 5%. So this is kind of what he was highlighting in his slide. And in this February of 2008 article about uh, preventable deaths, uh, a lot of them were due to truncal hemorrhage, meaning the you know, chest and abdomen. Uh, but uh, I think very important is this 15% of extremity hemorrhage uh, because there's a lot we can do for that. Now, the airway control in the field in a tactical setting, um, they discovered is that they don't need this as often as they were anticipating. Um, the ones that need airway in, uh, interventions are typically due to head or face trauma or wounds um, and using a nasal pharyngeal air, which is like a, uh, a little rubber tube, uh, like a miniature garden hose about the size of your pinky and perhaps five inches long and it's curved. Uh, and it has a flange on the end. And so basically this gets put into the nose and goes behind the pharynx and behind the tongue because one of the major reasons for obstruction in unconscious patients is the tongue flops back. And if a big floppy tongue can go back, that can actually cause an airway obstruction. So this is to overcome that. The cricothyrotomy is a is a incision that's made in the neck and you puncture the cricothyroid membrane and actually put a breathing tube um, into uh, the trachea directly. And so this is their airway of choice while under fire. Now obviously that may not have a lot of application on the civilian side, but uh, interesting to know. Now hemorrhage control. This accounts for 10% of all combat related preventable deaths. Uh, and so they're using hemostatic dressings, powders, tourniquets, and something we call permissive hypotension, meaning you allow the blood pressure to remain low. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, some powders, um, there is this quick clot and this Celox uh, Chitosan powder. Uh, the quick clot is a, a resin 
uh, this zeolite that actually absorbs water. And how does that work? Well, as it absorbs water, it concentrates clotting factors, concentrates fibrin, concentrates red blood cells. So it makes it easier for your body to actually form the clot. The Celox has an ionic binding that binds red blood cells. And this ionic binding creates a lattice of red blood cells, which leads to clotting. Now, the problem with the zeolite is that as it absorbs water, it has this exothermic reaction, meaning it gives off heat. So there's actually been a few reports of second and third degree burns related to this powder. Um, and so they've subsequently modified it. But if you're using just the same quick lock powder you pour into the wounds, realize that can have some very intense heat associated with it. Now there's some gauze um, in the uh, TCC, which is the you know trauma casualty care uh, group, they recommend combat gauze as the first line. It's made by the same people that do quick clot. Um, there's also Hemcon, uh, the Chido gauze, and the Celox gauze. Um, they all work fairly similar. I'm not sure why they picked combat gauze as their first line, uh, but that is what they go to as their initial gauze. So, tourniquets. This is an old technology. This has been around a long time, uh, but this is one that works. Uh, there's the uh, combat application tourniquet, uh, the soft T, the MT. These all work, and they work well. Uh, the colonel that was giving this particular talk really liked the cat. He said it was the lightest, smallest, easiest to use. You could pack a lot of them in with you without weighting you down. Uh, and so he recommended the cat. Now, if you need to get uh, vascular access, normally you try an IV, but that can be difficult uh, under normal circumstances and can be very challenging under intense circumstances like combat. They now have these things called interosseous drills. Uh, this basically puts a needle straight into the bone marrow of the humerus or the femur or the sternum. Um, it sounds barbaric and painful, but the pain associated with it is actually not uh, as bad as you would think. Sometimes people say it's even less painful than a standard IV stick. Um, so th if you can't get an IV quickly uh, using one of these IO devices, the interosseous devices like the fast one, the bone injection gun, or the easy IO, um, are all good tools. I have experience with the fast one, which goes into the sternum. Uh, way back a long time ago when I was in residency, we were doing some of the, uh, participating in some of the original studies with that. And my current experience is with the easy IO. Uh, we uh, take these with us to Africa uh, when we need to get quick IVs that uh, we can't otherwise do in the field. I love the EZIO, great tool. I don't have a lot of ex experience with the bone injection gun, but from people that have used it that I've talked to, uh, they like that one as well. For chest wounds, um, they put a sealant over it, something that will uh, block air, uh, that air one-way valve that we talked about. Um, so using a the, the halo or the hyphen or the bolin, uh, which is basically an adhesive that you put on the wound. Some of these can be challenging because there's blood and sweat and all this other stuff that makes it hard for the uh, stuff to steal, uh, seal and stick. So you're going to have to watch for that. Additionally, if you worry that you have this tension pneumothorax or this collapsed lung that's building up under pressure, you can take a 14-gauge angiocath, which is like an IV needle. So it's got a, a needle with a plastic sheath over it. You place the needle into where you need to go. Um, all, and then as you pull the needle back, it leaves this plastic sheath in place. So, And you need them long enough, three and a half inches. Uh, a lot of times if you just have the inch or inch and a half, it's not deep enough to get into the chest cavity. I've seen that um, in the field where it did not work. Uh, so make sure you get them long enough. Here's a picture of the halo, uh, which is the uh, sealant. And then on the right-hand side are the angiocath. So you can see um, the shiny metal tip. Uh, covered by the white plastic. So you again, you put those all the way in, and then as you pull the needle out, it leaves the plastic in place. Hypotensive resuscitation. Uh, Paul Pepe did a lot of uh, this work in the Houston area. I think he's now in Dallas. Um, and the military has looked at this as well. And if, the, if you can control the bleeding, then you resuscitate back to normal vital signs. If you can't control the bleeding, then you just resuscitate them until you can just feel a radial pulse, or if you have a blood pressure cuff, 85 uh, millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure. And the reason behind this is if you get the blood pressure up too much, they're worried it could blow off the clot, or you have to give so much fluid to get the blood pressure back up that you dilute the clotting factors and make it harder 
uh, to clot and then the saline is cool and so you can actually cool the body and make the hypothermia potentially worse. Hypothermia prevention. Uh, again, hypothermia is bad. Anything below 35 degrees centigrade or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, your mortality has that, that hockey stick where it just shoots up. Uh, cold leads to production of acid, uh, so you get this acidosis that actually can also cause your clotting proteins to not work correctly. So it's a bad one-two punch. So everything you need to do to keep your trauma patient warm is fundamental and key. Now in the field, uh, under combat situations, they have these med packs. Uh, they've got some antibiotics and some pain medicine uh, all put together. The antibiotic that the TC, TCCC recommends is moxifloxacin. It's a 400 milligram tablet that you give once a day. Uh, so they have one of these pills in because all these traumatic wounds are dirty just by definition. You know, the bullet isn't sterilized as people talk about. Uh, what It goes through clothes and basically takes whatever's on your clothes or dirt and puts it into your body. So uh, treating these wounds with antibiotics is advised. And earlier antibiotics is better. The nice thing about moxifloxacin is that you can take it orally and you can get the same plasma concentrations as if you gave it IV. Uh, so that's a, a great feature of this drug. Now for pain control, if you need to think uh, and you need to continue to return fire, again hopefully that's not a, a civilian application, um, but they will use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is like uh, ibuprofen or uh, Celebrex or Vioxx or these kinds of drugs, um, and Tylenol or acetaminophen. Uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and the acetaminophen work in two different pathways, so you can use them together. That's fine. Under severe pain, they give a narcotic uh, called fentanyl using an, uh, basically an orally absorbed form. So you can just put this little fentanyl lollipop in your mouth um, and get narcotics. And of interest, again, this is very much more for the... Um, uh, paramedics or the combat medics, but I think this is fascinating, is using this low-dose ketamine with very good effects for controlling severe pain um, and allowing evacuation of these uh, you know, mangled limbs or partial amputations. Uh, this is much lower dose than uh, the ketamine that they use for general anesthesia. Um, ketamine is one of my favorite drugs. This is always in my bag when I go to a third world country because uh, I can do anything I need to with ketamine and I don't even need an IV. You can give it intramuscular. Um, so again, fantastic drug. If you're in the medical field, I would learn about this one. Uh, it's considered in the anesthetic, so there's a lot of fear factor with it, um, but it is, it's got a great safety profile. Definitely one to learn about. Here's a picture of the uh, fentanyl lollipop. Um, and again, they recommend the uh, 1,200 micrograms that the uh, lower than this just wasn't achieving a level of pain. Anytime you give a narcotic, you have to monitor blood pressure and monitor respirations uh, because these can drop blood pressure and uh, make you forget to breathe. Uh, so you want to make sure that if you're getting very high doses of narcotics that you monitor for the complications. Now another really cool thing that was talked about is this field ultrasound. As you can see in this picture, they now have this... this uh, uh, new ultrasound that GE's putting out um, that looks like a, basically an iPod um, or an old you know flip cell phone uh, not not much bigger than that and so with this you can do what's called a fast exam which is a, a four look quick uh, ultrasound looking for internal trauma the chest or abdomen or you can use it to find IVs to get to IV access really awesome tool uh, that I I anticipate seeing this in the pre-hospital setting and the paramedic setting um, with increasing frequently over, uh, frequency over time. So that's a very quick rundown of this uh, combat casualty care. Again, I apologize. It's a little bit more technical leaning, technically leaning for uh, the paramedics and uh, combat medics that are in the audience. Um, but I think there are some things that are practical. Again, using combat gauze, uh, anybody can learn how to apply combat gauze. So if you've got a lot of significant hemorrhage, um, putting that in your kit uh, is a reasonable thing. Because um, on a civilian application, blunt trauma uh, and just accidents that happen day to day are going to be a lot more common than penetrating trauma. Um, other things to have and learn are these tourniquets. They're cheap, easy to learn how to use. And I think just with a comet gauze, 
a tourniquet and learning about a nasopharyngeal airway where you're putting it in the nose for somebody that's uh, unconscious or having difficulty breathing um, to keep the tongue from uh, basically suffocating them. Those are uh, simple things that you can obtain, skills that are easy to master uh, and probably worth putting in your back pocket. Uh, again, thanks for the amazing support I've had. I've had phenomenal questions. I'm going to work on trying to get a lot of these answers out. Um, but just hearing back from people is, uh, has been a, a real blessing for me. So uh, keep it coming. And thanks again.